calories and to break down the fats, the proteins, the carbohydrates, to use it as energy uh, to go forward. So it's great. So how many days a week are you training now? Like, what, how are you working out every day? Do you have rest? Like, how does that work out at, the, at this point? Because you've got lot. You always have lots coming up. I don't even think there's a rest time that you're having. What does your training look like to be able to do this? And are you doing it? Are you having rest days? Is it set out over thirty days? Like, how do you put your program together to be able to do this? Uh, right now, work has been very busy okay. over the summer months. Work yep. is high, or high, summer is high season for work. Uh, so like I said, I lift about 25,000 pounds a day at work. So uh, there's so your I, workout right there. Yeah. yeah, so over eight hours. <laughs> yeah. It's an eight-hour workout. Okay, Like yeah. going to the gym. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, it's good. But then I also need to add on the endurance part of it. So getting out for hikes. So when I do get a day off occasionally, yes. uh, try and get out for three-hour, four-hour, five-hour hikes uh, to, to get out for the endurance and that. But as work eases back a little bit, I'll be able to concentrate more on a specific working out. So adding a lot more stair training. Uh, so carrying 90 pounds up and down stairs uh, will be one of the key uh, aspects. Uh, one of the physiological aspects um, called your anaerobic threshold. And so it's kind of your red line. Yeah. And you can feel that when the lactic acid starts and the breath becomes very labored. So by pushing that anaerobic threshold, that red line, pushing it higher, allows you to work at a higher level. And so that's one of the key things for expedition to be able to handle the, the lack of the air pressure um, up because as you go above 14,000 feet, it's half the air density that it is at sea level. And then going further up Mount Everest, it's one third the air density. So your body is gasping for that air. And to be able to be more efficient at it, to have the oxygen carrying capacity is one of the key aspects uh, of being able to handle the expedition. So part of training will be to condition my body to be efficient at that. Because it seems that even in training, you have to push your body to the limit. It's not just on, I guess, race day, we call it. But when you're doing the events, you have to really push to that limit so you're ready for that. I see what you're saying about the high altitude. Um, and in training, when I've done like triathlon training for cycling, uh, very good at hill climbing. And in practice, I go do multiple runs um, of hill climbing on the bike. And I would push myself far harder than I would have to, hopefully, yes. in a race day. If I had to do it in a race day, at least I've done it in training. It would training. feel easy then, you know, yes. almost, if it was on a shorter triathlon, not like the Ironman now, but if you did a smaller one and you push that hard, you could probably really scoot it in a Yes, because I've done it in training, yeah. but hopefully not having to go that hard in the actual race. And so carrying that over to be able to push myself in a secure environment um, where, you know, if you... If you pass, pass out, out yeah, <laughs> exactly. then you yeah. want to be in a safe environment knowing hopefully you don't have to go that far that hard. Um, but should you have to, at least you know you've done it in training. You know that you've done that. So if you feel the blackout coming, at least you know where your breathing's at, what limits you've got, what you have to do to kind of just bring that back in again. So so that's really, really good. Um, what type of friends have you found doing this, um, doing this, I guess this, I don't know, this life that you've done for the last 20 years, have you found people that love to do it like you do? Like, have you? Or is it you? Yeah, it's me. Is it <laughs> Mainly you? me. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of my friends, you know, they've, they've just got other priorities in life. And so okay. uh, getting out training isn't high for them. Yeah. Uh, but for me, that's what I enjoy. That's my lifestyle. And that's, what, that's my aim that I really enjoy going. And But as far as... The expedition. Um, a lot of people, of course, are interested in in talking about you know the expedition. They've seen it on TV or something like that. Yes. But to be able, so I've met some fantastic people. You know, standing in line at the grocery store, standing in line at Costco, walking down the sidewalk or something. Someone will they say, "Hey, you know," it's like, and then they'll want to talk about Mount Everest and. And so hundreds of people, you know, like... And this is how I found you interesting when I met you, because we did talk about things like this. So I found that exactly. most this is, this interesting, is, you know, so isn't it? This yeah. is a perfect example mm. of a situation like this, right? The, you know, to have, to be able to have this opportunity 
to to share with you uh, yeah. in this. And and but yeah, just to meet so many people um, who are interested in it. And that's the thing is they want to live vicariously. They know that they're through you. Through, yeah, yeah, they, so they know that, that they're physically capable of not doing it, or their wife won't let them go do yes, it. Yes, never. And so, but they just want they just want to see it. They just want to be part of it. And so that's what I'm hoping is to bring people along to share the adventure, to share that whole excitement of it and for them to see it through photos, videos, and then to be able to come back and talk with them and, and to share that experience so that they're part of it. And so for me, that's been actually one of the greatest things is the people that I've been able to connect with um, through, this, through this expedition, the preparation for the expedition. And that's good because when I met Ryan, I met him at a club that he was actually speaking at. I think the first morning that I met you, I think you may have been the speaker that was talking when I was with my friend Mark. And um, I, I was interested straight away in what you had to say. And I think that might have been one of the reasons I came to listen that morning because I think he said that you were speaking about kind of training, exercise type thing that I'm really, really interested in. And this would be a good point to tell listeners just how fit Ryan is. In my own life, with the fitness things that I've done, I've always been the person within my environment that's been the fittest. And last year, I went on a walk with Ryan, which was not really a walk. So if you wanted to see the unfit Sarah Shakespeare going up um, on our trail walk, um, Ryan walks extremely fast, um, backwards even. Um, before, when I've gone running with clients, I've had clients tell me personally not to run backwards because it's not motivating them to be ahead of them. And I used to say, it's okay, I'm talking to you, you know, I'm just, I'm, just follow me, it's okay, I can run backwards, keep up, the, keep up the strength. And then here I am last year with Ryan, and he's the one running backwards, and I'm behind him struggling. Do you remember on that hill? I remember yeah. that. <laughs> and we went for a long time, and it's actually for the very first time, probably in 20 years, I asked somebody how long was left. Do you remember we went round that corner and looked at that wonderful view? Are we there yet? You remember? Is, are we there yet? Because the end's near. And we saw some people on bikes, and I felt like I wanted to steal their bikes when we saw those cyclists up there. Um, so even for me, that that actually had a bit of an awakening for me because normally I've been the one in the environment where I've been the one pushing people. I've been the one that's been able to be the fittest doing something with no limitations. But Ryan can walk up something really steep, really fast, and not look like he's out of breath. And I tried to look ladylike doing it, didn't I? But how long did we go for? About three hours. About was three it? hours. It was yes. about three hours. And I, I don't, I can't remember if I slept in the afternoon afterwards. I'm not sure what I did, but it was, it was trying. But Ryan just looked like, okay, I'm going to work now. Do you remember you were coming to work remember, for the day? Yes. And um, so that's how I got to know Ryan a bit on that walk and got to see his fitness level, I guess, right in front of my eyes. And it wasn't a walk, I have to say. It was quite the trek up there. But for you, it was a training walk. And for me, it was a little bit harder than that. So, But it was good on the legs. So that's what I'm going to say there. Now, one thing that you've called yourself when we talked about you doing motivational speaking, you called yourself a motivational doer. Tell me what that is. Motivational doer, not a motivational speaker. I've just found with my personal experience um, that for me personally, actually, I don't talk a lot. Um, I more more of action. Yeah. And oftentimes, and no offense to people who are the motivational speakers, I think a lot of them do a fantastic job. Again, that's a talent yeah. that I don't so much have. Um, but I often find that oftentimes a company or something will hire a motivational speaker and it's great enthusiasm and emotion yeah. at the time. But a week later, people's lives haven't changed and they just go back to as things were. Sometimes, yes, there is sometimes people are motivated to make a change and that. Um, but sometimes words just aren't enough uh, to go hear someone and that. So I find being a motivational doer uh, by doing it. I find in the people that I talk to, uh, even in the preparation, uh, they feel motivated to even go do something, to go do a, tr a little trek. Uh, what might to them might feel like Mount Everest, um, but for them, I mean, it's a huge uh, step forward. So taking that first step. Uh, so I want to just encourage people uh, to be able to do things. And so maybe I don't speak a lot of words, um, but I want to be put it more into action. I think, you know, there is that saying, there isn't that action speak louder than words. We've heard that that phrase our whole life. And I think it's you just putting that into practice and people looking 
and saying, well, how would Ryan put that together? So maybe, like you say, maybe you're not at the front of the room being that speaker, but you're that doer that people talk about and go, well, you know, Ryan's done this and do that. And you kind of, you can see um, that the actions do speak louder than words. So how can we get a hold of you? If you want to follow Summit or we want to talk to you or be in touch with you or get advice from you, what's your contact? I will post it on our on our replay anyway, but just so anyone who's listening has got their pen and paper and they've become highly interested in what you're doing, and I know it motivates people, How? what's your contact and how can we get a hold of you? Uh, the easiest would be through the website, uh, so summitchallenge.ca. And you can follow along. So when I'm actually out on expedition, that's where you can follow along with the photos, the videos, and the updates. And also you can check out, um, I have 14 amazing sponsors. And uh, a lot of them are local business owners here in Kelowna um, and also around Western Canada. Um, and they are fantastic. So check them out. And if you want to get in contact with them, I can arrange that. Also, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Ryan Morris. You can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Mount Everest Summit Team, and that's the easiest way. Okay. And one question I wanted to ask you about, which I thought about earlier, what do you like about living in the Okanagan? So anyone who lives here, because I mean, it's my dream destination to live. So anyone that I interview from the Okanagan, I guess I just want you to share with people why I think we live in paradise. Well, I moved here, as I said, back in 2000. I moved here. I love the hot summers. So do uh, I. That's so, what, yes, so that's what I love. 35 degrees oh, Celsius, 40 degrees Celsius. <laughs> yes. I love that. Okay. Um, so a lot of people can't handle that. I hate that. it, I know. So they're not, they don't see my yeah. excitement. I mean, you seem to see that excitement in that I do, but a lot of people don't. So, okay, you like that? I like that. And then, as I said, you know, switching over to winter as well. I uh, love the powder snow. Uh, that we get here and where I live, I can just walk out my door and go trek into the forest and snowshoe hike all throughout the winter. And so for me, the Okanagan is a great base place to be, uh, to be able to go to the Rocky Mountains or or that. Uh, for that. So the Okanagan, definitely a great place to Good. be. Good. That's how I feel. I, I hope that would be your answer from our previous conversations. So I'd like to thank you very much for being on the show tonight. Well, I, I think it. it's thank great. You. When I met with Ryan before, we spoke for over two hours, so I think we've done really well fitting this into our 60-minute window here. I think it's been great. I'm just going to finish up the show tonight. We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, talking a bit more about how you can get a hold of me as well if there's something that you'd like to work on. This year, what I've been working on is doing some co-authoring in some books and kind of having my story out there that people would like to know more about me. So I had a book come out in May that was Women Rising, and my story um, in there was about mindset and ambition and self-care and how that can help you create a beautiful life. And that's what I geared my um, keynote speech around, was everything that was in that chapter of that book. And... Um, that's on Amazon, so you can have a look at Amazon for these books that are out. And what that talked about was my childhood and how having very, very enthusiastic, positive parents, how that helped me a, you know, look at a big picture thinking, the school that I went to, the environment I was in, the goals that I was set from a very young age helped me create a life I've got as an adult. And it helped me come through my teenage years, through my 20s and 30s. So a lot of that book tells you about that side of me. Um, the next book that's coming out, and um, that actually came out on July 27th, was Starting and Finishing the Story Together. And that tells the story of my parents and their 47-year journey together. Um, and they happened to pass away um, in the same month. And my dad passed away two weeks after her funeral. So it talks about the influence that my parents had on me throughout that life, through the life that they formed and the enthusiasm they had for me. And just their wonderful story from beginning to end and how having them in my life has helped me have gratitude for people in my life so if you read that story I know it sounds really sad but there's some you know there's some great parts of that story that will make you smile and what I have coming out on November the 1st is the three D's dedication determination and dedication and sorry discipline and what those three points mean to me and um, when you want to run on full engine so that's coming out on November the 1st and um, so that's a little bit about me if you need to get a hold of me, then it's 250-864-2936. And that's it for tonight. Thank you very much for tuning in with Ryan and I. It's been a great show. I found him really interesting, and I know that you would have. So I will see you in two weeks' time.
Okay, bye then.